Welcome everyone to season 3 of Build and Grow Money Matters, a series dedicated to helping businesses go beyond financial management to achieve financial growth, resilience and innovation. As businesses continue to revive and pivot to newer models in these tough times, your story is proud to partner with HSBC for another season of inspiring conversation, insights and observations. We feature the newest trend setters in business and stalwarts of the ecosystem to help businesses power the next phase of growth. and business continuity joining us today we have taran chabra founder of nemans taran is a business analytics leader from new jersey in the us he has helped several pharma and life sciences giants in the us pivot their current operational strategy and move towards the path of growth his zeal to question why comfort is undervalued and why natural materials were not chosen in the footwear industry led him to the path of creating nemans welcome aboard taran Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys having me here. My name is Madan, and we have of all of us at your story. Welcome to our audience for joining us today. My first question to Taran is: Tell us a little bit about your backstory. How did you get to where you are today? How did you begin your growth? You know, you're in a market where already people are familiar with giant brands like Nike and Reeboks. So, how did you start, and how did you get customers to know about you and start buying your products? I've worked in the US for about ten, twelve years, right? So I go. I come from a core technology and a business strategy background, right? So I watched the Indian ecosystem grow, evolve very closely from the US, right? So I was away from India for about ten, twelve years, but that didn't stop me from studying the Indian ecosystem, how brands were set up, and how consumer companies were coming to life from two thousand sixteen onwards, right? And and the idea from Neiman's uh, sprung about uh, from my own personal frustration, so. this was a travel experience or a travel trip that we were taken back in 2016 right we were taking a train trip uh, i still remember from madrid to stevie and i had one suitcase full of shoes right uh, i had a running shoe i had a walking shoe i was there for a few days of work so i had a work shoe i have an i had an evening lounging shoe and if anything happened to the four shoes i had an extra shoe right so <laughs> look at my travel experience right five different shoes Put in a suitcase, you know, and uh, so and and what happened during this whole experience was the suitcase was left aside, and I was trying to jungle around the train station, in in trying to buckle up and and take the suitcase right, and uh, then I started wondering right post this travel experience why couldn't there be one shoe designed for all day wear right why aren't brands focused for crafting a different shoe for different activities right. that's when i started contributing conducting a lot of interviews back in the us back in india in trying to understand what's the core rationale for people to buy footwear right and i got several you know reasoning like running crossfit right work uh, but the undervalued thing that i found was comfort right about 60 to 70% of the people kept telling me how you know comfort was their core rationale to buy more than one pair and that's when uh you know i figured out that this is a, a big problem to solve and i started diving into it so we spent two years to you know select some of the best materials out there and we started or we launched back in december 2018 to be precise right and uh, when you ask about you know how we have spread the word it's all about content right uh, we are uh, extremely unique in the materials that we use so we started questioning as to why the whole footwear industry is you know uses synthetic materials which are not good for the skin which are not good for the environment which emit close to 10% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere use a lot of water and all use petroleum based oils right so we started uh, you know i come from a background where i look at nutrition behind every product i i purchase right i'm the annoying guy who questions calories and what are the ingredients that go in so it was very uh, natural for me to look at the materials and and then use materials which naturally exist in the environment or materials which have lost their life we bring it back uh, in the form of recycled materials and then we launch nemans thanks taran you mentioned that uh, it's a great story how you came up with the idea of the product and the sourcing and so on now you use you use sustainably sourced merino wool castor bean oil and recycled rubber for your shoes so are these materials coming from india is it possible to get some of these sustainable fibers from india itself taran it's been an evolution right madan what we've started is when we launched in 
And back in 2016, 2017, I still remember, you know, reaching out to a bunch of manufacturers in India, right? Talking to them, trying to explain as to why these materials would be better. And nobody gave me a shot, right? Nobody was, nobody even understood what these materials could do. And nobody was, you know, willing to deep dive into a startup, right? Which is using uh, materials which are typically not used in footwear. So back then we kind of created the entire ecosystem on our own. Right, we went to South Korea for our merino wool. Uh, we went to China for uh, insoles and outsoles. Right, so we did a lot of research in terms of uh, the best country for the best material. Right, and over the years, we have now built the ecosystem in India. Right, I think uh, within the last uh, twelve to sixteen months, we have now moved uh, our entire manufacturing to India. Thanks, Tarun. Uh, the big question on everyone's minds these days is uh, the COVID pandemic, of course. So can you share with us how you managed to weather this crisis? What were the unique, peculiar challenges you faced? And how are you maybe pivoting using new kinds of innovations, technologies? Tarek? For us, uh, the pandemic hit us in a different way, right? Uh, we spent about a year in creating a product market fit, right? And uh, reaching out to the right set of investors. And we raised capital in February last year, right? So it was... February 2020, we closed around and we were super excited uh, with a bunch of new colors that we were launching in some of the styles, right? And uh, we have been working, we're sitting on a phenomenal month and the country went in lockdown on March 20th. So we went to zero revenue like any other brands out there, right? So it, it wasn't different for us, but but the good thing here was we, we had just raised capital. So we were sitting in in, in good uh, cash to, you know, to take the right decisions uh, from then on. And what we started looking on is what could we do during these tough times, right? It was not the right time to push a footwear product. It was not the right time to put, push aggressive advertising. So we started fixing on some low hanging fruits in the business. We started looking at some technologies that we wanted to implement and were not able to implement because of, of, of time issues. So we brought in a few softwares and we started looking on newer product innovations, right? We started looking at a lot of research the entire manufacturing industry took a hit. So we started talking to the biggest and the best of manufacturers all around India and started looking at some other materials that we could introduce, right? Now, everybody was stuck at home and uh, wearing sneakers wasn't the norm. So we said, what could we do during these times? We introduced our first ever environment-friendly slipper. We called it the Eco Flip and the Eco Slide. Now, slippers and sandals have been sold in India forever. But we, you know, uh, added about 50% of recycled materials. We added natural oils. We added natural rubber, which is biodegradable. And we introduced a, a much better, a comfortable and an environment-friendly slipper. And it was phenomenal, right? The response that we got from some of our existing customers was, was off the roof. And uh, we also introduced organic cotton, right? Now, cotton has been around for so long, been used in T-shirts, shirts, forever. We said, how could we introduce a better version of cotton? And we introduced a recycled cotton sneaker, 100% made in India with uh, you know, natural rubber sole, super comfortable materials. And we said, you know, you're working from home, you're not gonna step out, but you could use these shoes for workout at home. You, know? you could use these shoes uh, for, if you're out for a walk, these are, these are great shoes for walk. So we started looking at the trends of, of what the consumer is doing and then we started creating products around it. Thanks, Tarun. Uh, you mentioned quite a few times the word organic in there, but even in many organic products, apparently chemicals are still used, right? So how do you get that balance right where you use chemicals, but still have the branding and the message and the promise of being organic and sustainable? Right, so let's look at uh, traditionally how footwear was sourced, right? Now, footwear, 60% uh, of the footwear industry is leather, which comes from animal skin, right? And then there is synthetically sourced uh, polyester, nylons of the world, which is again plastic, right? After its life, it ends up in oceans and in landfills. So what we are doing is we are polluting the environment in a very big way. And these materials are not good for the skin either. So what we've started to do is we've started to look at each and every component that's used in footwear, right? There is upper, there is insole, there is lining, there is an outsole. So footwear industry is in general, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in making a shoe. So what we've done is we've started to identify each and every material and then used a better version of that material, right? It's either natural, 
which is uh, available within the nature or it's recycled, right? It is something that we have to use. So what we have done is instead of dumping it in the oceans, instead of dumping it in the landfills, we have brought it back and given it a new life. So what we are saying is this is not 100% natural. No footwear in the world today is 100% natural. But what we are saying is our footwear is better than what was created earlier. And we have reduced the amount of carbon dioxide that a typical shoe emits, right? So it's a better version of what existed. We're not 100% natural, like I said, but it's a journey. We're working towards it. And hopefully in the next few years, we should be able to create a 100% you know, sustainable product. Thanks, Tarun. You've talked about the product and the customers. Let's talk about investors now. Last year, you raised a million dollars in a pre-series A round led by Anikat Angel Fund, along with participation, I believe, from AngelList and other serial entrepreneurs. So tell us how difficult it was to maybe convince investors to invest in a sustainable footwear business? And maybe how did you utilize this round of funding? Tarun? Right. Um, so now, uh, footwear industry in India has, uh, you know, India is the second largest market in the world, right? Uh, and it again sells more footwear uh, after China and, and United States of America, right? So there was never a doubt of the, how big the industry was in India. But something peculiar in India is there, there hasn't been any innovation in the last two decades, right? Neither in the supply chain, neither in the materials, neither in the way the products are being sold, right? So this was a, you know, a challenge for us initially, right? Because the investors didn't have uh, any brand to compare against, right? There's never been a startup that's come in, that's grew and then led off the ranks, right? There have been uh, leading public companies like the likes of Relaxo and a few other companies that have come in have done well, but none within the price range that we were going after. And sustainability wasn't a norm, you know, a few years ago. So we started taking, you know, one step at a time. You know, we knew that uh, if we had approached investors with a product or with a deck, we're not going to get capital, right? So we said, uh, let's put our savings on the line, right? If we believe in this concept, let's dive into it. I'd quit my job from the US, you know, come here, you know, built an entire team, started doing everything in-house. And post first three to six months, when we saw enough response from the customers, right? When we saw people liking the product, repeat purchases started coming in. We had the right metrics, you know, to convince a set of investors that this is a great, uh, you know, market to go after is, is when we started talking to, you know, investors across the country. And uh, we raised uh, our first round of funding from some amazing set of angel investors, uh, you know, who believed in our journey, right? Who believe that, uh, you know, on, on what we were building, right? Firstly, all these investors were existing customers. So it wasn't hard for us to convince them on the product, right? Uh, I think everybody had tried our product, they had used it extensively and they loved it, right? So there was no doubt about the product. We just had to convince them on how big the market is, what's our journey gonna be, right? How we're gonna evolve and how we're gonna build a big sustainable global footwear brand coming out of India. So it took about three to six months of pitching and uh, then Annika Angel Fund, like you said, you know, we were the first investment from them. Uh, the, this is the first investment from that angel fund. So it was amazing for them to deep dive and, and you know, have us as their first investment. Thanks, Tarun. That's a very inspiring story coming back from the US, finding out a good vision for uh, not just a business, but for an environmentally sustainable product. Tell us a bit more about the international scope of your business. I believe your wool comes from Australia. The design is in the UK. The fabric creation is in South Korea. Some assemblies in China and the sales are in India. Would it be possible to do all of this within India itself in one location? Tarun? It is. So what we're doing is, like I said, now we have moved our entire uh, manufacturing process to India. Right, because when we call ourselves a sustainable footwear brand, something that was extremely important for us is to reduce the carbon footprint. And if the product travels to less locations, right, then it becomes more sustainable. And, and plus the entire supply chain functions, you know, a lot more robust if it is located in a close proximity. So now what we've done is we have found out, uh, you know, the right manufacturers in India, the right assembly guys in India, and now we are, uh, like I said, we are making our uh, slippers 100% in India. We are using, we are making our wool shoes in India. We are making our cotton sneakers in India. So we are building the entire supply chain in India, right? Along with our growth, what we are doing is we are enabling all these manufacturers to use better materials, right? We are kind of educating them 
on why these materials are better for the customer, for the manufacturer, and uh, you know for the environment as well. So it's a it's a win win, right? And in terms of uh, you know Neiman's being a global pay, all right? We we never had a doubt that uh, you know the whole market that we are going after, the product that we are building, is a product for the international market, right? We started with the Indian ecosystem to start small and then to spread our wings, right? and now we are already identifying a lot of markets you know for example us australia a few sections in the uk and looking to do a few pilots up there right because the product is there the entire supply chain is created and now we are looking at uh, you know expanding to different markets around the world thanks tarun let's go back to some of your future plans that you mentioned earlier uh, the pandemic has changed obviously a lot of your product and business plans you had plans i believe to come to new delhi to bangalore and to mumbai but the pandemic has halted some of these plans are you looking at revisiting these plans and expanding to these cities again sir so not not at this point uh, i think we have uh, we've kept our thoughts evolving right and and as entrepreneurs right as business owners i think look at the current situation and then planning uh, you know swiftly is something that is extremely critical for for us right when we had launched we were looking at uh, going offline very very quickly right because footwear in 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 india is touch and feel right and the retail ecosystem is very big and and d2c in india was about 7 to 8% uh so we said uh, you know let's look at uh, creating a few experience zones across the country back then but now with the amount of penetration that we've been able to do digitally we've kind of pushed that plans for some time right because covid has uh, accelerated how people shop right now people are more comfortable sitting at home trying the product so we've said why can't we do you know be digital and give this experience for customers just being home so we've pushed the retail plans it's always on the cards for us right but it's at least 24 months away for now our plans is to be aggressive on being omni present right to create that kind of experience when the person is home we have given a no questions asked return and refund policy right you don't like the product wear it for 7 days 14 days you use it however you want to if you feel this is not the right product we'll take it back right unlimited exchanges unlimited uh, you know times we'll go ahead and we'll start that we'll we'll keep delivering to you until you find the perfect size so all of these things have reduced the apprehension in the consumer's mind right and have you know ensured they sit at home and then try the product so we feel there's enough scale that is available just by being d2c in india in the current times and once the retail starts coming back up right once start people you know actually they start going out and exploring shopping malls would be the time we would look at uh, you know opening our stores across delhi bangalore and even mumbai for that matter Thanks, Tarun. Speaking of India, opening up, you also have launched, I believe, a recent brand with Made in India sneakers. Tell us That's a little right. bit more about this brand and how it differs from some of your other products. So the brand is the same, right? Uh, all all the products that we have come under uh, Neiman's ecosystem. Right? So basically, what we have done is, like I said, uh, a bigger criteria for us was to build sustainable supply chain within the footwear ecosystem in India. So as and when we started looking at product innovations, material innovations, right? and we started uh, looking at specific pain points that we wanted to resolve for our customers in india we started looking at suppliers within india so earlier this year we've introduced a made in india you know sustainable slipper which is called eco flip we've also introduced a made in india eco slide right all these uh, you know both these categories are 100% made in india made with natural rubber 30 to 40% recycled materials recycled compounds natural oils and so on and the second material innovation post merino wool for us has been cotton we blended cotton with recycled materials we have added our you know proprietary merino wool which comes from australia all along the insole and we have added a natural rubber sole so these two products for us have started doing very well and are 100% made in india Now, Tarun, you've had a lot of international exposure. Can you share with us maybe what you think are some differences between, say, the U.S. market and the India market, and what it means for opportunities for a brand like yours? Now, the ecosystem in in America is a lot bigger, right? Even though you know we as in India are an extremely big market, 
our market is a little smaller when we compare upwards of premium and luxury, right? Our market is more towards the economy segment. And when you look at, uh, you know, international markets like the US or Europe, right? The penetration and the cost sensitivity is a lot lesser. So that means for brands like us, there's more room for expansion, right? And sustainability over there is, is extremely big in terms of the consumer, right? They have, you don't have to educate them on what sustainability is, right? They've already made choices for uh, better materials. They already know why recycled materials are better for the environment, right? why they've you know chosen less of plastic so this it's already imbibed in an international customer right so for brands like us it's a lot easy to expand up in international markets whereas in india i think uh, the market for sustainability is still building right it's a work in progress covid in a way has you know accelerated the whole thought process because now we're looking at natural fibers for our skin right uh, if you look at the amount of growth that, you know, the wellness category has had completely highlights how the thought process of, of people have shifted, right? They're no longer going after brands just because a, a huge celebrity is backing that, right? They're looking at the story. They're looking at where the products are made. They're looking at why the brand had started, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, benefit is the product going to have on their body, Right. So I think India is moving towards it. And I say this to our team a lot, right? This is new age India. So this is willing to back newer brands. This is willing to try new products. You know, who could have thought uh, that a Greek yogurt company would come in in 2017, like Epigamia and do so well in India, right? And so I think the trends is, are, are changing in India. And now we are uh, moving towards a lot bigger market, especially with the high rising incomes in India. Thanks, Taran, for pointing out those other trends from other industries as well. We mentioned sustainability many times today. Can you share with us what do you think about sustainability as a future trend? Would it be a niche? Would it be a major force? What are some of your positioning in this trend? Where would you be in maybe two to four years in this sustainability mission, Taran? So I think uh, the way people are looking at sustainability, right? People are looking at sustainability as a trend, right? People are looking at sustainability as a way for brands to you know market their products right but i feel sustainability is the future right sustainability is is here to stay right there are finite amount of resources available in our environment so if we keep abusing them there's going to be a point where these resources will will go away right so that's where brands like us have started looking at materials that are naturally available within the atmosphere that you know, are renewable in nature, right? They come in and they keep growing by themselves. So I think a bigger brands have already started to take notice, right? And they've started to adapt to sustainability in the next two to three years. Now I keep reading about bigger apparel brands predicting that by 2025, every product of theirs would be sustainable in, in nature. Now sustainability doesn't mean 100% natural. Sustainability doesn't mean 100% chemical free. What we got to understand is in the case of manufacturing, in the case of product building, there is going to be some amount of chemical that's going to be involved. But how could we reduce that amount of chemical that's being consumed? How could we use materials that are better for the environment is what is going to be differentiated in the years to come. So I feel in the years to come, a bigger thought process that's going to be in the, in the consumer's mindset is, why should I buy this product, right? Is it not only good for me, is it good for the environment, right? I think customer is not gonna be paying a premium for sustainable products. That's where brands like us have to work on making these products more and more affordable. And the day we make them affordable and comparable to synthetic products is the day the adoption of these products would go a lot, lot higher. So the positioning for Neiman's is one, we are an exceptionally comfortable speaker, right? Make no mistake, we just don't say buy a product because it is 100% sustainable. No, we say you would have never worn a sneaker like this before. You would have never worn a slipper like this before. So our first positioning is comfort. And then we say we have innovated the entire supply chain. These were the materials that existed before. These are the materials that we brought in now, right? Who could have imagined that you could wear a sneaker without a sock? We did that. So Neiman's is India's first sock-free shoe. Who could have imagined wearing a sneaker in summer and in winter? 
Our shoes are temperature regulating. They adapt to your skin and outside environment. So what our merino wool shoes do is they keep you cool in summers and they keep you warm in winters. So that's the composition that we've created, right? They are breathable. They are 50,000 times stronger than any other material that exists today. And plus they are flexible, right? So all these propositions as core value give, our, give us the biggest of edge, right? That's where a consumer is feeling good about the purchase with us. So first ever, he says, whenever a customer buys a product, he says, I've never worn a shoe like this before, right? To, to name even Harsh Mariwala from Mariko Group, right? He's tweeted on Twitter on a public platform saying he's never worn a more comfortable sneaker than Neiman's, right? So that's, that's, that's amazing for us, right? So that's, he's not said this is the most sustainable sneaker because when you talk about it, you're not going to say that. You're first going to talk about how the product has changed your life. So we say this product will fit in your life. It'll improve what you were wearing before, right? It's hundred steps ahead of anything that you have, you have owned before. So I think uh, that's the first uh, core value proposition for us when we look at introducing any natural fiber. And, and then, you know, whole carbon footprint, environment benefit, that's, that's what we stand for anyways. Thanks, Tarun. It's so great to hear about the power of your message and the kind of validation you're getting from the industry also. My last two questions for you are about your relationship with money. Since this show is Money Matters, my question for you is, what is your relationship with money? What's your preference? A huge corpus for retirement or a consistent healthy return on investments? Taran? So uh, the relationship with money has kind of been strange over the years, right? <laughs> like I said, I've, uh, I've gone from the time wherein uh, I was making about $300,000 a year to moving to India and, and working towards creating a brand or creating... Uh, building a thought process that never existed in India, right? So uh, it was a downward trend initially to begin with, right? But it's it's the vision that I was going after, right? It's the journey that I was trying to take and looking at, uh, not looking at immediate monetary benefit. So I, I'm a guy who looks at healthy returns on an ongoing basis, right? So I think that's how I, I, I look at money and all my investments uh, over a period of time. Thanks, Saran. So what has been your experience with working with lenders and banks? As an entrepreneur, what has been your experience? What are your expectations? And what are your tips to the audience on how to deal with lenders, investors, banks, and so on? Saran? So I think every, uh, uh, you know, lenders are different, banks are different, investors are different, right? Uh, so the thought process has to straight, has to completely change on who you're working with. Now, back then when we were looking at uh, raising capital from banks in India, it was extremely difficult, right? Because a few years ago, if you had to raise loans from banks, one, you had to be profitable, right? So for me, the underlying question that, that I kept asking myself is asking the banks, is how do you expect a startup to be profitable in six months or eight months down the road when you know you're making a long-term investment, right? So I couldn't understand the whole thesis of, of how you know, banks operated. And, and banks are a little reserved in a, in, in a way how they look at loans. So I think, um, you know, going after investors or going after angel investors who know you, who believe in what you're building is, is the right way to go at least in the first couple of years, right? And, and as and when, you know, the first investment comes in, then a lot more doors open, right? There are lots of capital that's available via revenue share, right, via lending, why NBFCs and, and then banks also come into, uh, you know, the picture, if you have been, uh, you know, if you have registered for over two years and, you've, you know, and if you're making, you know, steady revenue. So I think it's, it's channeling each and every, uh, you know, the source, depending on, on the time frame of your business. Thanks so much, Tarun, for this very engaging conversation. I think three takeaways from me and for our audience are sourcing, style, sustainability, the three S's. Sourcing, take a look at the global and local advantages of sourcing different kinds of products and skills from different parts of the world. Focus on style as well as the substance of the product, the message, the impact it has on the lives of your customers and sustainability. Try and be as sustainable as you can in every sense of the word. Thank you so much, Taran. I wish you all the best in your journey ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madan. Appreciate it.